Hey, Don, thanks. <laughs> um, I think we, hello, Wendy. Thanks for um, setting things up, Michael. So are you gonna add me? Oh, cool. Can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I sure can. I was just muted. And, um, All right, and I just need to know, Wendy, do we have your permission to record this? I don't know. I can As talk. a matter of fact, Richard just asked me if you were going to be recording it because he would love that. So, okay. so yes, you absolutely have our permission. If we okay. if we can share it at some point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think, uh, well, you know, uh, at least it will be recorded and then whatever Tom has in mind. Yeah, mm -hmm. of course. You are you are a silhouette at the moment. Me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> this overhead light lighting. So, of course. Um, around eight o'clock this morning, my internet goes down because I have Comcast. Mm, so I am, in, uh, I am in the library, the public library, in a room in the library. Uh, maybe it it's like. it is unfailing that stuff like that happens. Yeah. <laughs> Let me just see if I can do something about the light. Probably too dark, huh? So, uh, because I've not met either one of you in person, Can you, you are. Yes, that actually is better. Okay. That works for me. All right. So, you are Don, right? Yes. And, and Tom, right? Th this is Michael. Um, Tom. Oh, Michael. Michael. In Montreal. Okay, my goodness. I'm just a, a SAW volunteer. <laughs> this is an international thing. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, it's a pleasure to meet you finally. It's a pleasure to meet you too. I actually met you very briefly at Comic Fest, San Diego Comic Fest, right before the world shut down. Um, and it was just one of those situations where I was like, I don't know what to say. <laughs> so I think we talked very briefly. I remember Comic Fest fondly, and I remember that the very that very week we heard that the next convention we were going to was canceled because of COVID. What a strange journey it's been. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, so I worked out some questions. I have a bit of a slideshow. I also mm -hmm. have props. I have all the fancy books. Oh, excellent. <laughs> My favorite things in the world, those books. Um, and of course, the biggest one. Absolutely. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> I want to look at it so bad, and I, I'm also like, I can't bring myself to open it. I just need to open it. Well, maybe you'll <laughs> open it on camera today. Right. <laughs> so, so as I understand it, we're going to be talking to a bunch of students. Yeah, um, SAW is the Sequential Artist Workshop in Florida. It's basically folks of all ages who are creating comics and take various classes through either online or face-to-face -face in Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, creating comics. Um, some folks have been published. Some folks have self-published. Some folks are just getting started. I um, hope some, nobody was harmed by the hurricane. I don't know if they're in Gainesville. So I, oh, Gainesville. Yeah, I think it's pretty far north. But I'm not uh, going to pretend I'm great on Florida geography. <laughs> Hello. Who's this? These are some of the students. I think that some folks are coming in early. Ah, okay. No sound, so. I should say fellow students. I am also a student at SAW. You are? Yes. But, you're, but you also teach, right? Well, I teach at the University of Mississippi. Mm -hmm. My I goodness. Florida, Mississippi, <laughs> Canada. You are international. <laughs> yeah, all over the place. <laughs> 
what what I might do just before we begin is uh, mute everybody just so that we don't get background noise, Hello. and then Hello. ask you to unmute. Okay. Hello. Sorry, Michael, you were saying you're just going to start off with everyone muted. Yeah, just, you know, some people unmute and forget. And then, you know, we hear dishes crashing and people arguing and gunshots. So just mute <laughs> gunshots, how interesting. So the focus is on you. <laughs> we've, we've heard all kinds of, hi, Adrian. We've heard all kinds of uh, accidental audio from people. Well, I know what an opinion Canada has of America right now. <laughs> so gunshots wouldn't be a surprise, would they? Well, and I, I actually live in Memphis. Gunshots are definitely not a surprise. Mm. <laughs> There's a lot of gunshots here. Mm -hmm. Hi, Wendy. Thanks for joining us. Hello. What's your name? Hello. I, you might know me. I'm who initially contacted you, Lisa Klug. Oh, you're it says, Lisa. Hello, Lisa. Uh, I, I'm the Lisa, yes. Hello. All right. Awesome. Good Great. to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. I'm very glad to be here. I'm very glad that the uh, audio is working out well. Yeah, this can get, these can get tricky. I'm glad we're all here. <laughs> I've, I've done many uh, a Zoom meeting where uh, we, we struggled with the audio for like 15 minutes in. Oh, no. <laughs> Yeah, I was worried about something like that, too, but uh, don't want to jinx us, but so far, so good. So far, so good. Well, you look very comfortable. I see one, two, three people so far, it looks like. In addition to us running things. Oh, I, I guess uh, us mods are seeing more. I, I see about seven more people. Really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, let me let me scroll. Oh, okay, there's more. All right. All right. I I get it. I yeah, just had to probably, scroll. Folks will probably um Peter in, you know, in the first That's how it happens. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, I'm very used to that. <laughs> So are you in upstate New York right now? In upstate New York, and it is at peak color and absolutely gorgeous. I definitely miss upstate falls. We don't really mm. have those down here. Did you used to live in upstate New York? Yeah, I grew up in Binghamton. Oh, goodness. Heavens. So you've just been all over. Yeah. <laughs> is it strange to live down south? Having been uh, having lived in uh, upstate New York, yes, and I think we underestimate how things like seasons and weather affect us beyond just you know having to buy different clothes or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or at least I underestimate. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm fascinated with how you became an ElfQuest expert. Oh, I don't know about expert. But, <laughs> but yeah, um, I started reading uh, with the uh, first few issues of the the epic reprints when when mm -hmm. I was about ten ish. Mm -hmm. Found them on a um, family vacation. It was raining, so we went to a store and they had you know books and magazines. Um, and my parents were like, "Get something because." We, don't know, we were camping. They're we like, I don't know how much we're going to, uh, we're not going to be able to go to this or that today. So get something to read. Or... And I got a couple issues of ElfQuest and I was hooked ever since. <laughs> well, the Marvel uh, reprints got us a whole new audience because they, they helped us to break into the uh, newsstands and spinners at grocery stores and things like that. And so it was it was a tremendous boost for our sales at the time. Wasn't it one of the first like um, creator owned deals? Like people. One of the very first. Yeah, yeah. like it's commonplace now with like image and things like that. But oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Quest with Marvel was one of the first creator owned. But yeah, Marvel Epic decided to mm -hmm. try um, uh, creator owned 
properties and and we were as far as i know we were the first one they invited cool cool <laughs> yeah i think maybe i mentioned that in the introduction i, mean, I think i mentioned it somewhere or i asked a question about it but we'll get to that <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I was involved with Holtz quite a bit back in the day and Holt fandom throughout my you know, 13 to 16, around there. Well, they still exist. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, After I'm all still, these years. I still get newsletters from Rapid River Holt. Uh, mm -hmm. I think they're on like issue 80 or something like that. Probably. All right, so we'll get started in just a minute. Uh, it's just about time. So um, I guess I have just an introduction and then we'll go into the questions. Yes, uh, you know, whatever, you just kind of guide me and you know, okay. if, if you want me to talk or expand on something, just let me know. Okay, and I made a PowerPoint to sort of accompany some of the sets of questions. Wonderful. Visuals are so important to any presentation these days. Well, there's so much beautiful artwork. I was like, I don't know what to pick here. And I was trying to, you know, be um, make stuff that, or pick stuff that corresponded with the, the sort of line of questions. Mm -hmm. um, all right, I guess maybe we should get started. It's just about time. So uh, welcome folks, uh, we're here to, Michael, you're gonna say something? Yeah, I was just, let me just do this mute all and un unmute you, but it looks like everybody's muted. Yeah, okay, cool. Hi Actually. everybody. <laughs> um, welcome to, I don't know the whole spiel for the sequential artist workshop uh, when they usually introduce the, the pro calls. Uh, but um, welcome everybody to the Sequential Artist Workshop call. We'll be speaking with um, Wendy Peeney today um, and talking about her career and her, her artwork. Um, I ask that you, um, you can post questions in the chat and we will have time at the end where um, you can unmute and ask questions directly. Mm -hmm. But if you have questions that come up throughout the, the discussion, um, feel free to post them in the chat so we can come back to them um, if something spurs your interest as we're discussing things here. So I'll start off with an introduction and then we'll just go into um, questions. So uh, let me pull up a little slideshow here. It looks like I'm looking down, but I'm really looking at everybody. Ah, uh, there we are. Okay. So um, Wendy Peeney may po be popularly known as the artist and co-writer of ElfQuest, uh, which she's created with her husband, Richard, since February, 1978. I think 1978. Well, uh, it was in development in 77, but we mm -hmm. brought out the first issue in 78. Um, For those, for those of you who aren't as familiar with ElfQuest, uh, in terms of the story, it takes place on the world of two moons, a planet similar to, though decidedly not Earth. The comic book chronicles the story of Cutter, chief of an elf tribe called the Wolf Riders. His quest, reflected in the series title, changes as the story progresses. In the first 20 issues of the series, dubbed the original quest, the Wolf Riders are burned out of their forest home by a group of humans. Cutter leads his tribe across a vast def desert in search of a new home. And on their journey, the wolf riders discover another elf tribe called the Sun Folk. Thereafter, Cutter's quest shifts towards locating more tribes and finding the elves' ancient home, the Palace of the High Ones. He aims to bring all the elves together and make their ancient home accessible to any elf who wishes to return. That is a very brief summary of a long and epic journey that has much more nuance and detail than I offered here. 45 years worth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I just wanted to set, set up a little bit about the comic to say ElfQuest is the longest running fantasy comic book in the U.S., maybe in the world. Possibly. Uh, it's also the longest running comic book by a woman cartoonist. And as I have argued, uh, the longest running LGBTQ plus comic. Yes. 
ElfQuest was also one of the first comic series that was widely available in graphic novel format through chain bookstores and in libraries. Um, over the years, Wendy and Richard published ElfQuest through their own company, Warp Graphics, and through Marvel, DC, and Dark Horse. In addition to ElfQuest, Wendy has created an adaptation of Edgar Allan Poe's Mask of the Red Death, which was originally a flash-based flash action comic uh, before being published in graphic, graphic novel format. Mm -hmm. um, Wendy also created two um, gorgeous graphic novel adapta adaptations of the 1980s TV series Beauty and the Beast, among many other works. Uh, this int introduction only really scratches the surface. I've had a very checkered career. <laughs> <laughs> and right now you're working on turning Mask into a musical. Well, it is really very, very far along. Mask of the Red Death. Halfway through doing the webcomic, I said to myself, this thing is a musical. And I began thinking in those terms. And, and when I finished the comic, I used the script to create a, a treatment and a libretto for a musical. And um, I've, I've had tremendous luck finding talent to help me along my way. So the music is done. The music is done and recorded with awesome. the vocals. It's fabulous. It's, it's in the vein of Jekyll and Hyde or Sweeney Todd. It's a dark, bloody musical. And I just love that. <laughs> yes. um, and, and your work on ElfQuest has been translated, also been translated into various media, including novels, yes. games, um, and most recently an amazing, amazing um, audio series. Um, well, I agree with that adjective. Uh, we, have, <laughs> we have such an amazing cast with talent from so many shows that people are familiar with, like mm -hmm. Star Trek and Supernatural and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And so many of the actors, it surprised us, grew up with ElfQuest and they wanted their parts <laughs> very badly. <laughs> yeah, I remember seeing uh, Cree Summer posting about ElfQuest like mm -hmm. a while ago, like long before the audio movie, how much she loved ElfQuest. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so maybe we'll just jump into the questions. Um, I just wanted to get folks on a similar page with the introductions. Um, so my first questions have to do with uh, working as a professional artist and developing into a paid professional artist. Mm -hmm. So if I remember correctly, you started, you were in college, you were working on Law and Chaos, which was- I was, I, I formed a relationship with Michael Moorcock when I was 16 years old. I wrote to him and he apparently liked my letters very much and wrote back to me. And I asked his permission to do a project, to do a, um, you, you might al almost call it a motion comic version of Stormbringer, uh, it, you know, I had never heard of that technique before. It was just something that occurred to me that I would, I would like the artwork to, to appear to move uh, through the use of fades and dissolves and various camera tricks. So uh, I, I started on the project when I was about 17 years old and, and uh, went, oh, it went for years. And uh, there were hundreds of pieces of artwork and I did some actual filming on it in college, but it's a project I never finished because I just bit off more than I could chew. And uh, it, was, it was just too much for one person to do. And, and in a sense, Mask of the Red Death is my way of finishing Stormbringer because, because I got to do my own dark, comic ad adaptation of a horror story, but, uh, but it, the material is mine, which makes it even better. <laughs> and um, I, it was just around the same time you were um, working freelance, and I think you had stuff in, was it World of If? And I think this is a cover from Galaxy Magazine. Uh, I, I had stopped work on Stormbringer, and, and uh, Richard and I were married in 1972. And it was around, around 73 or 74 that I began to work for Jim Bain and do uh, illustrations for uh, Galaxy and If science fiction magazines, 
uh, you're looking at one of the covers, one of my first covers. Uh, it's such early work of mine, but uh, I don't know. There's a little bit of ElfQuest in it already. <laughs> um, so that went on for several years. And uh, then I got involved with uh, doing the uh, Red Sonia and the Wizard uh, theatrical production. Uh, it was a traveling show that went from comic convention to comic convention that Richard and I did with the, uh, the artist and, and really the spirit behind Red Sonia, the Red Sonia comic, Frank Thorne. Uh, we, we, all three of us created this show that we traveled from convention to convention with, and it was tremendous fun and really gave me a lot of theater experience on stage. And uh, it was through that experience that I was invited to write an issue of Red Sonia in, uh, uh, I believe it came out in 1978. So that was, that was my first professional work in comics. And at the time, Richard and I were developing ElfQuest. Okay, great. So mm -hmm. you kind of um, started with this bend toward animation and mm -hmm. you've also done so much work in different types of media. So how did you um, find comics or how did you decide to pursue ElfQuest as a comic as opposed to like an animation pitch or something like that? Well, I never intended to grow up and be a comic artist. That was a big accident. Uh, <laughs> I was a Marvel fan in my teens. And in fact, that's how Richard and I met through the pages of the Silver Surfer comic. I wrote a letter in and it got printed and he, uh, they printed my address as well and he responded. And that's how Richard and I met. <laughs> but um, I, I had been a Marvel fan and collector and uh, that's how I was familiar with the comics medium. Jack Kirby was my unwitting sensei. <laughs> and uh, also I discovered uh, anime and manga, which were in the very early stages in America in the uh, 1970s. Um, we could see shows like uh, Astro Boy and Kimba the White Lion which were the creations of Osamu Tezuka. Mm -hmm. and so he was my other sensei, my, my Asian sensei. So my, my comic cartooning artwork, which I did as fan art mostly, was a combination of Jack Kirby and the uh, Asian manga, mostly Tezuka influenced. So um, I heard somebody speak. Or, well, anyway. Uh, I'm curious um, what the, oop, too far ahead. <laughs> I'm curious what the comic scene was like at the time when you got started with ElfQuest. Oh, comics were popular. They were a guy thing, you know. Uh, there were very few women that read the superhero. Mar it was Marvel in DC. Mm -hmm. And then a couple of other, you know, uh, there was Archie and, and you know, but uh, mainly it was Marvel and DC, Harvey, I remember. Uh, and uh, superheroes were the thing. That was it, you know. And uh, Marvel began to experiment with other types of things with uh, Savage Sword of Conan and bringing in the Elric uh, character which was interesting uh, and um, uh, delving into fantasy. Uh, I think Marvel uh, did that. And I think DC also had something called, was it Excalibur, if I remember correctly, which was more a sword and sorcery kind of comic. So, you know, with the advent of Star Wars and Lord of the Rings being so, so hugely popular in the mid seventies, you started to see more fantasy imagery coming out in pop culture. Um, and uh, this is what got Richard and me excited that, that maybe the time was right to bring out something like ElfQuest. I'd, I'd had the story ideas for a long time, but, um, but you know, you kind of have to wait for when the time was right. And the mid seventies, were when, you know, it was the whole hippie thing, you know, everybody dressed like an elf back then. You wouldn't believe it. It was all fringe and hair and leather vests and, you know, so, 
So <laughs> drawing elves, you know, that was all very familiar. <laughs> um, so yeah, we we were we were catching light lightning in a bottle in the mid seventies with mm -hmm. ElfQuest. Uh, there was nothing else like like it on the market, and uh, it just took off like wildfire uh, immediately, uh, like like no other independent comic had. And yeah, there weren't, and there weren't many independent comics at the time, right? Mm -hmm. Like no. Star Reach, um, maybe one or two others. Uh, and how did folks, how did sort of the mainstream of the comics industry, like Marvel and DC folks, respond to ElfQuest initially? Well, we took ElfQuest to Marvel and DC uh, because we didn't know Jack about being publishers. Um, we had decided to do it, the story in comic book format. Um, because we thought, well, writing it as a prose novel, presenting it as prose, you wouldn't have the benefit of the artwork. And, and we felt the art, artwork was extra important. Mm -hmm. So the best way to tell the story was, uh, you know, since you couldn't just walk into Disney and get an animated movie, you know, <laughs> uh, the best way to do it was in comic format. And because we didn't know anything about publishing, we took it to Marvel and DC and, and they both politely rejected it. They thought it was too peculiar. <laughs> that was the word they used. It was just nobody had seen anything like it that had been you know, influenced by uh, Japanese manga and anime. So uh, they just didn't know what to do with something that looked like ElfQuest. Um, and uh, we had a false start with a publisher who didn't work out. And then we decided to Little Red Hen it and uh, bring out the second issue ourselves and reprint the first one. So Excellent. that all happened in 1978. And it took off from there. I remember reading. Absolutely. Um, by the early 80s, it was outselling Marvel and DC, some Marvel and DC titles, the mid-level titles. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I used to get a lot of, I used to get a lot of guff from Chris Claremont about that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because we did outsell one of the X-Men titles. And, you know, so Chris Claremont gave us a lot of guff about that. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so can we switch gears a bit? I want to talk a little bit about your process for creating issues of, mm -hmm. of ElfQuest um, and getting into like your storytelling process. So in various interviews I've, uh, I've read, um, that you and Richard had the plot of ElfQuest worked out well in advance mm, uh, yeah. before the individual. The issues. basic skeleton of the story, we, we knew where the story was going. We knew what the quest was, what Cutter as the leader of the quest had to do to achieve his goals. And we always kept that through line. There were many side trips, many, mm. many visits off the backbone of the story to the ribs. But <laughs> but we would always go back to the backbone of the story and just keep it going uh, on okay. the hero's journey. So when you're work when you're working on a particular issue, what um, does that start with moving from the skeleton to then a script or to roughs or to kind of verbally working it out before? Yes, basically back back in the early days, uh, the the imagery you're seeing on the screen right now is from what we call the classic quest. And there were 21 issues of the classic quest in magazine size format uh, in black and white. Uh, we simply didn't know what we were doing. So we made a lot of choices that, that a lot of people told us were crazy. We, we made it magazine size, we made it black and white, we brought it out three times a year. Uh, it was written and drawn by a woman. It was, you know, it, it had everything going against it in the 70s, but somehow it all worked. And so Richards and my uh, process would be, we would sit down over pizza and we would talk through the story of a given issue, which back then was 32 pages. And um, then I would write a rough draft of the script I would uh, uh, pencil and illust illustrate the story and ink the art. And uh, back then I also did the lettering, which I was awful at. I'm a terrible letterer. Uh, <laughs> 
but you know, it, it, we were the only game in town, we too. So we did it, we did it all. And um, that, that's basically how we did it. Uh, once, once I got the script written, I would, I would do the art and finish the art. And then Richard was the editor and the publisher. He taught himself from the ground up how to be a publisher. He went to people and asked questions and knocked on doors. And he found us a, a printer who, who uh, was a newspaper printer, but who could also print magazines. And so he worked out that deal with them. And, um, you know, we just, it, it just took off and it, it almost took off too fast for us. We, we were not ready for, uh, we, to put it bluntly, we weren't ready for success. Uh, the first issue uh, sold 10,000 copies. The second issue sold 20,000, the third 40,000 and on and on. It, it, it just ballooned so fast. And it's because we came out at the right time, the public was ready for it. And we found a female audience. We found women who were eager to look at artwork like that and read a story like that. They weren't interested in superheroes. They wanted something else. And we were the something else at the time. So I think we had, at one point uh, we calculated, we had about 54, 56% female audience, um, more, than, more than males. And we were very proud of that. That's awesome. Mm. Uh so I do want to start a little bit to get into some of the controversies surrounding the comic, but I think it connects too with your storytelling. Um, mm -hmm. So you would um, work out the story verbally and then you'd create everything. Um, mm -hmm. Hello, you froze. Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, I didn't oh, freeze. Okay. I'm, I'm trying to figure out where I am in the questions here. Oh, all so, right. Um, when you're when you're working on the story, um, there's lots of things in ElfQuest that have sort of been controversial over the years. Some to readers, some to people outside mm -hmm. um, the readership. Um, and over the years, comics journalists have noted um, different controversies. Academics more recently have talked about some of the groundbreaking things that ElfQuest had done, particularly in relation to like the elves' morality. And in relation to sex and sexuality, as well as gender and gender roles. Yes. And I think one academic noted that male characters in ElfQuest were more often rescued than female characters. And it was just some of the subversive things you might not notice at times <laughs> until, you know, you really follow the story. We uh, had a really strong desire to take fantasy, fantasy cliches and tropes and just flip them on their ear. Uh, you, you know, if you look at um, the image of the cover of issue number two, you can see that Cutter is chasing Lita on his wolf. But if you look at Lita's facial expression, she's not terrified. She's almost curious. She's looking back almost like, what the heck is this? Rather than running screaming like the typical frightened female in a heroic fantasy story. And so we wanted to give the readers that cue right on the cover. And yes, we wanted to show Cutter's bad behavior. So yes, he does grab Lita and sling her over his shoulder, but we had to show that so that we could later show how she completely turned that situation around mm -hmm. so that she was in charge the whole time. And, um, uh, even today, as, as uh, people, younger people are discovering ElfQuest, some of them are saying, oh, well, you know, that's, that's sexist, how Cutter treats Lita when he first meets her. And, you know, because people just love to slap labels on things these days, more than ever before. But uh, if they read further, they have to read further and see how every time you see behavior that looks a little bit offensive, it's because we're doing that deliberately so we can turn the situation around and show how it could be handled in a different way. And that's, that's basically been the formula of the whole story. 
Yeah. Um, and I think that even as a young reader, I sort of pick picked up on that because they would mm-hmm. get mad at characters at times and then they, they'd get sort of their comeuppance, even if it was something kind of small or mm-hmm. things would turn out differently than mm-hmm. uh, than you, uh, first seemed. Um, as, as far as the male characters getting rescued are, you know, we start the story literally with a burning at the stake and Red Lance, we think of our of Red Lance as uh, the equivalent of Pearl Pure Heart. <laughs> Red Lance <laughs> just seems to be the eternal victim. And uh, his uh, his life mate Nightfall is the one who usually rescues him or, or uh, gets him out of a bad situation. If, if there were railroad tracks in early ElfQuest, Red Lance would have ended up tied to them. <laughs> oh, <no>. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to dig into a, a few of the controversies. I hope that's yes. okay. And I guess I should warn the audience. There's nothing in here that is, but some, um, there's images of um, depictions of childbirth. There's images of depictions of, um, I guess, an orgy for lack of a better word, but nothing. Well, that, different kinds of sexuality. Yes. Yeah. Um, so let's, I think one of the big controversies in the cover was on the previous page is from EQ number 17. Yes, the um, fam- infamous orgy scene. Yes, in 1983. Um, and I guess at the time there were readers all over the map. I remember reading the letters column and the letters column has folks saying, thank you for sort of introducing these things. Uh, mm-hmm. I use it as an opportunity to start discussing things with my kids who are reading the comics as well. Yes. Um, some people were outraged. Yes. Um, outraged at different things like. Um, well, an example I can give you is that with with this issue, we received a Manila envelope with this the pages of the orgy scene torn into confetti. Uh, a mother sent us these pages torn into confetti in this envelope. And she let us know in no uncertain terms how offended she was. However, she was not the least offended by the violence, Mm -hmm. the brutality of the war scenes. You see this, you know, the word orgy has been applied to this, but basically what this is, is a celebration of life Mm -hmm. by people who know that they are probably going to die tomorrow. They are going to war. They are going down into the troll caverns. They are going to meet their worst enemies. And they are going to try and win back their ancient home, the Palace of the High Ones, from the frozen mountain trolls who have kept it all these years and uh, will, will shed blood in order to protect it. So these, these characters know that a good many of them are going to be dead tomorrow. So they are celebrating life. They are saying goodbye. They are connecting. They are, they are uh, promising each other that no, I won't die. They are, that everything is happening on these pages. Unfortunately, some people just tend to focus on the naked bodies and just think that's awful. And they don't read what's really going on there. And, you know, we don't care. You know, we're not there to police people and see how they take it. And but uh, but the ones that do get it, we are really, really pleased with that. Well, and that's what I was going to ask. And I guess there was a controversy even before this, because I think um, there was a controversy. You killed a character, a main mm-hmm. character, major character. And mm-hmm. I think there was a controversy because people are so used to in comics, if you kill a character, they're not really dead. Right. Now, that wasn't so back in the 70s so much. Okay. Uh, back in the 70s, dead was pretty much dead still. They, they, weren't, they weren't stretching the envelope the way they do nowadays to, uh, you know, it's really fan service if you think about it, uh, you know, to kill off a character so the fans feel the emotion of the character's death, but they don't feel it fully because they know the character is going to be brought back in some way all the MCU, DC movies, they all have that. 
and and this is what people are used to nowadays that the death doesn't really mean death but for us that you know this is why anytime we did kill off a character it was super significant for us because that character was never coming back again and uh you know our readers we did we were hard on our readers sometimes because there were times when the story called for that mm -hmm. and that's what i was going to ask so how um so there's this sort of controversy um within the, the the fan community within the readers how do you deal with that um well you don't i mean i mean you don't get upset mm -hmm. you you just you uh our letters pages, as a result of the infamous issue 17, Richard, as editor, wanted to be sure to show a, a good cross section of the type of reaction we got. It was almost universally positive, I have to say, because our fans are very, very cool. But <laughs> nevertheless, we did get some, you know, questioning and some very negative comments. And Richard wanted to show those as well in the letters pages. So, so you saw a cross section of reactions, but deal with it. You know, we knew what we were doing. Mm -hmm. We knew that we were doing something that you don't see in Superman or Thor. <laughs> you know? and, and we knew that it would be challenging to some people. In fact, as we were planning the story, I remember we were sitting in the car and, and we looked at each other and said, and we said, can we get away with this? Can we do this? Because we're going to be showing polyamory. We're going to be showing that even though Cutter and Lita are the closest of life mates, they have absolutely no problem with sharing. Mm -hmm. You know, this, and this is the first time we were just going to come right out there and, and show that. And, and also we were going to show that, you know, for example, there's Skywise, he's got two girlfriends and a boyfriend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we, we, we wanted to show the gamut of love in these pages, and we knew that was going to push some buttons. I think we were ready for it. It, it wasn't too upsetting to us. It was wonderful to get the front page of the comic book buyer's guide. <laughs> You know, Elf Orgy, Elf Quest, you know, I mean, the, the sales of the buyer's guide really went up <laughs> for, that, sure. for that article. Uh, and I guess I also had questions too, because then at times um, there were controversies sort of outside the fan community. Mm -hmm. um, like, I guess in 1986, I can't, I can find the city, this comic shop called Friendly Franks was raided yes. and ElfQuest was one of the comics the police confiscated. My understanding of that is because the comic that they con confiscated simply contained a birth scene. It was mm -hmm. the scene of a birth of a baby. And uh, someone who had a grudge against the comic shop owner uh, decided that uh, he could, he could get the owner in trouble by uh, showing this to the cops and saying this was pornography. This was their, you're looking at the pages now, and this was their idea of pornography, birth scenes. Uh, so uh, <laughs> realistic birth scenes. Yeah. Uh, I think the thing that's funny is um, if they, these were the issues they saw, I'm like, you missed so much. That oh these boy. <laughs> <laughs> there is so much more we did that they could have gone after. <laughs> um, so, so this this controversy was was really a tempest in a teapot, and it was about somebody's revenge against somebody else. He tried to get them into trouble, and and the uh, thanks to the CBLDF, the the um, the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund, he he was spared any any uh, financial loss. And, uh, you know, it's just a little story we tell over beer and mm -hmm. buffalo wings, you know? <laughs> well, so in that sort of situation, did you sort of stay out of it? I know you've done a lot to like help, um, what's the acronym, C uh, CBLDF, like donating things or giving artwork or, or giving things. Oh, sure, them. sure. I've, I've donated to CBLDF, uh, Richard and I both have, uh, you know, for many years. My favorite was Peter David. Um, I sketched a drawing of Co 
cutter on Peter David's arm. Peter David, for those who may not know is just how do I sum him up in one paragraph? <laughs> he's <laughs> he's best known for his work on the Incredible Hulk series, but he's done so much. He's written prose novels, he's written screenplays, he's, you know, he's just he's just a fixture in pop culture. And he's a friend of ours. And so uh, he had me sketch do a sketch of Cutter on his arm. And he said, um, if you and Richard will donate a thousand dollars to CBLDF, I will go get this tattooed on my arm. And we could not resist that. <laughs> so so we we donated, we took P Peter to the tattoo parlor. We gave him one last out. You know, I said to him, Peter, are you sure? Because this is going to be for life. <laughs> and he said, no, nope, I'm going to do it. And he nice. got he got his cutter. And then a few years later, um, I did a Lita on his wife, Kathleen's arm. Oh, nice. And she got Lita. So David and Kathleen are going to go through the rest of their lives with Cutter and Lita on their arms. <laughs> but, um, it's wonderful stuff like that that makes participating in the comics community. You know, mm -hmm. you, you make wonderful friends. You, you meet, you meet like-minded souls who enjoy the same things you do and who have the same hopes and dreams for a better world, you know, and, and they all do it their way by telling stories. So we, so the, the co comics creative community is really, really a wonderful place to, you know, be with like-minded souls. That's great. Yeah, so I guess my question was around, like, how do you deal with the controversy externally? It seems like you kind of let, other people who like the 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 legal defense fund take care of it and kind totally. of just reinforce them and help them. Totally, it never reflected badly on us at all. If anything, I mean, I remember Elfquest along with X Men and, and a few other comics got burned on the Seven Hundred Club, mm -hmm. and we considered that an, a great honor. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to offend anybody who might be here, but we considered it an honor to be burned <laughs> by the 700 Club. <laughs> we were demonic, you see, because of the pointed ears. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Which is ironic because that's the theme in the comic, right? The humans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, There's everything about ElfQuest is real. Mm -hmm. uh, ElfQuest, in many ways, is autobiographical. We've based a lot of the things that happen in the stories on things that actually happened to us. And we translated those things into fantasy metaphor. Uh, because for Richard and me, we don't care for Harry Potter-ish fantasy where you wave a wand and a dragon appears or a unicorn or something like that doesn't float our boat. We like fantasy for the purpose of making a comment about the human condition. And we mm -hmm. like to use it as a metaphor. So everything in ElfQuest is actually very real. It's very down to earth. It's, it's, it's not the high elf Tolkien stuff at all. Mm -hmm. um, I guess in terms of subversive material, you took a much different approach on mask in terms of, oh. I don't know if I would call mask <laughs> subversive. That's pretty overt. <laughs> Yeah, ma mask is just right out there, and and it was something I really wanted to do because I really ElfQuest has been such an exploration of the of the light of of characters coming from the best part of themselves. Our characters are are uh, not human, but they are human like, and you can identify with them, and and what makes them vibrate a little higher than humans is they always try to come from the best motivations in themselves. They always try to, whenever they can, be kind. Uh, that's, that's very important to them. It's not like they live by a code or a religion. It's, it, it, it all comes down to, let's just try and treat each other as well as we can. So that's kind of a, a high vibe uh, in the light sort of a way of approaching life. And 
as an artist and a storyteller, I am also a lover of horror, particularly Edgar Allan Poe and, and uh, writing of his type, deep, dark, romantic horror fiction. Um, I wanted to explore the dark side and uh, reinterpreting Poe's Mask of the Red Death as a webcomic, a graphic novel, and now a musical gave me a chance to really explore the dark side. Great. Um, so I think I'll move the slideshow along here. <laughs> I was trying to find a great picture that showed the sort of like gambit of ElfQuest incarnations and in sort of different media. Well, uh, by my hair, you can tell, tell this photo was back in the 80s. I'm afraid I look too much like Tammy Faye Baker. It scares me. Um, <laughs> But yeah, we started, there started to be t-shirts and the two little dolls we have there were gifts from fans of, of, of yeah. fan made them. Um, and, uh, you know, there, I can see the, a couple of versions of the role-playing game, the gather them, the, this is just kind of a cross section of things we had going on in the eighties. And there's been stuff like that ever since. Not a whole lot of it, but mm -hmm. it's it's just been an ongoing thing that that we do these licenses here and there. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I was kind of using this to get at more um, how you approach adapting your work into other media, so mm. uh, like the novels or um, mm -hmm. the musical or the audio series, the ElfQuest audio series. Well, when you have something that has a really strong and firm uh, existence, a really strong storyline, um, it, isn't, it isn't that difficult to envision it in other formats. And of course, there was always uh, an outcry from the fans, you know, when is there going to be an ElfQuest movie? And Hollywood has been optioning ElfQuest since the mid 80s. I mean, you know, <laughs> <laughs> the option money is very nice, but, but um, what happens and, and what is continuing to happen is that we will, uh, we will get involved with, uh, you know, a film group or a TV group uh, that says, okay, we, we love ElfQuest, it's great, we're going to do this, this, and this, and then as things progress, we find out how much they want to change it, and uh, we just couldn't allow that, uh, you know. Why take something that is basically adult material and try to scrunch it into a children's show mm -hmm. format, for example, and then try? Why try to put Christian values into you know like good versus evil and submissive women and and um, uh, macho men? Uh, that whole trip. Why, why try to shove those values into ElfQuest when ElfQuest is the, is the exact opposite of that? Mm -hmm. if, you, if you say you love it, then for crying out loud, interpret it as we give it to you. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Hollywood to this day wants good versus evil. They want duality. They, you know, we always get asked, who's your villain? Who, who does Cutter have to fight and defeat? To, to make the story work. And my God, we never did that with the story ever. It was, it, it, we always did Shades of Grey and ElfQuest and everybody was the hero of their own story. Even our worst character, Winnowell, she was most definitely the hero of her own story. We, we like to show all sides mm -hmm. because Richard and I don't believe in good and evil. We believe in knowledge conquering ignorance, not good conquering evil. So that's the approach we've always taken. But to this day, Hollywood doesn't see it that way. And, and until we can find somebody who does, there probably won't be an ElfQuest movie. So the ElfQuest audio movie is such an incredible joy for us because we found people who not only got it, some of them grew up with it and said, but of course, we're going to do it this way. We're going, we're going to present ElfQuest the way it is. And um, uh, 
Dagaz Entertainment and Realm and uh, Fred Greenalge, our director and producer, and Jonathan Woodward, our, our producer. Uh, just, we all just meshed into this team to find the right actors, the right music, the right sound effects, everything. We all worked together very closely. And, and what got produced was um, an absolute dream come true for Richard and me. It is utterly faithful to what we created with some of the greatest actors that we know wanting to be part of it. You know, Cree Summer, <laughs> she, she didn't even want to see the contract. She said, I don't care about the contract, just sign me up <laughs> because she grew up with it. And, um, you know, and so she became our Saba. She became the narrator of the show and she did an incredible job. Awesome. And, um, you know, uh, it's, um, if you have to have a partnership with someone else, I wish for everybody to have a partnership where they could be as completely satisfied with the outcome as we are with the audio movie. Okay, that's great. So yeah, it sounds like the lesson here is be careful about when you're moving into other media and you're bringing other people in to make those things happen, be careful yes. about who you partner with. Well, there are sco two schools of thought on that. There are some people like the creators of the, the very popular comic series Saga who have said they don't want a, a film or TV adaptation. They are very happy with it as a comic and they would prefer to keep it that way. There are other people, um, and I would give Stan Sakai as an example, the creator of Usagi Yojimbo, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which we've been fans of for, for a long, long time. But uh, the arrangement that he made with, I believe it's Netflix, Mm -hmm. is to do a show that's a complete variation from Stan's comic and to do a, ki a show aimed at kids that puts the story in contemporary times and makes it kind of uh, almost, it's got a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle feeling about it. And Stan was apparently okay with that because he can go ahead and do his comic and, and do the Usagi stories the way he wants. And then the show gets kids interested that might have never heard of the comic. Mm -hmm. So there, there are two schools of thought, but, but Richard and I are not ready to have someone spin off a, a show that just isn't ElfQuest. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I, I think this segues into my next questions about, um, so for the first 20 plus years, y'all self-published ElfQuest. Mm -hmm. um, and you also worked with Marvel, DC, and Dark Horse. Um, mm -hmm. um, I was curious, you talked a bit about the, the challenges in self-publishing, learning everything from scratch, um, working with a printer, getting the comics distributed. Well, I can only talk a little bit about that because I wasn't too very involved with that. That was Richard's uh, area. And uh, he, you know, my hat is continually off to him for for what he accomplished because he taught himself how to be a publisher from the ground up and he formed the relationships with distributors he attended the distributors meetings in various parts of the country he um, made himself a light and a presence uh, and a powerful voice sometimes for independent comics um, uh, yeah, I remember even in some of the editorials and issues of mm -hmm. ElfQuest throughout the yes. 90s, talking about like the, co the cost of paper affecting yes. comics, talking about the distributors and movement, uh, things they were doing and how they were affecting the whole industry. And oh, yes, bring that especially in the 90s when, when there was a terrible crash mm -hmm. and many comics companies, particularly independents, went under and never recovered. And Richard got us through that. Uh, he, he used every trick in the book to get us through, it, through that because you know distributors went under owing us hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so he had to find a way to continue to finance the publication of our comics line. And uh, he did. And um, you know, uh, he just has my infinite respect 
mm -hmm. for for just keeping things going no matter the ups or the downs in the industry warp graphics has just always been a constant for 45 years on mm -hmm. account of his leadership mm -hmm. so but uh but truthfully i didn't have much to do with that end of it richard and i kept our roles quite separate uh it was it was far enough for me to be in charge of writing the script penciling the damn pages <laughs> inking lettering you know <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. you know and i had to it, i had to meet a, a deadline uh mm -hmm. and uh i was very very uh tenacious about meeting my deadlines so that's what i was focused on and he focused on what he was best at okay i think that, um Piggybacking off that and uh, is more of the question around DC. We were talking, I think, before the actual talk started um, about how you, you've worked with Marvel, the Epic imprint, um, DC, Dark Horse, and that it was uh, ElfQuest was actually one of the first uh, creator owned titles mm -hmm. published by a major publishing company yes. with Marvel and the Epic imprint. Was it Archie Goodwin? It was Archie Goodwin. Uh, he was he was our angel, along with uh, Mary Jo Duffy and some other people uh, associated with the Epic line that were very supportive of us uh, coming in there. And so, um, yeah, they they reprinted the classic quest and asked me to do additional material, additional pages, uh, because the story was broken at different spots than we broke it the way we brought out the series. So they needed bridging art and new covers. So that was my job uh, uh, doing that. But uh, we were treated very respectfully and uh, it gained us an entirely new audience because it got us into newsstands and on spinners in grocery stores and places like that. So we were being discovered by people who had never heard of ElfQuest before. Mm -hmm. I was one of those people. <laughs> yes, you were one of our, our Marvel kids. <laughs> well, well, yeah, and um, ElfQuest got me into comic shops. I had not, mm -hmm. you know, seeing that on the spinner rack at a store mm -hmm. and, you know, discovering, wow, there's all these comics that are, they're not superheroes. And yes. ElfQuest is amazing. Yes. In the 80s, there was what, what was called the black and white boom. Mm -hmm. And all sorts, you know, it started with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and then a lot of... Uh, a lot of copycats did comics similar to the turtles, but then other comics came out that were just their own thing, just mm -hmm. just really inventive stuff. Uh, there were there used to be in the '60s the underground comics, which were very drug and sex oriented, very out there, wonderful, over the top stuff, just just wonderful, wonderful, brave stuff, but the in the independent comics we could tell stories that were more adult oriented but at the same time they could be more for the general public and that's why we could have that's why we could have the numbers that we got okay um i guess my last set of questions is about um as someone who was a you know a fan um from about 10 11 um, and a super huge fan and got involved in the fandom um, in my teenage years. Um, I know that you and Richard have always done a lot to sort of cultivate relationships with fans and yes. uh, create a sense of community, a sense of family. Yeah, our earliest, uh, in our earliest years, we depended on word of mouth. It was the fans writing letters to fans. I mean, there was no such thing as cell phones. There's no such thing as the internet. Uh, they communicated with each other by letters and phone calls and getting together at conventions and, and uh, you know, creating their own newsletters and fanzines, and just as you're showing here. And uh, that is how ElfQuest was publicized back then. We didn't do much marketing. We were just able to rely on word of mouth from the fans and from the uh, comics retailers who also recommended our books. Mm -hmm. And I think um, one thing I also remember was the, the fan club. I think mm -hmm. we print um, membership addresses so you could find out people who were in your area. Yes. 
yeah, that it was kind really of reminded me of your Silver Surfer story in a way, like when they used Absolutely. to. Absolutely. Oh, ElfQuest is responsible for at least four marriages that we know of and a bunch of kids. Yeah. <laughs> and some of them are named after our characters. <laughs> mm -hmm. nice. um, I guess. So do you have. Um, if you're trying to to get people invested, um, you also did a ton of conventions, right? I'm just yeah. trying to think logistically how you would uh, connect with fans today. Con with conventions were right. extremely important to us, mm -hmm. uh, especially in the earlier days. Oh, it, it really was a way of reaching out and connecting with the fans. Uh, things, things have certainly changed since COVID. We are dipping our toes back in the water of, of conventions, but it's, it, things have changed. It's not quite the same. And so uh, currently we, we rely a tremendous amount on the internet, on mm -hmm. Instagram. And, uh, you know, we're investigating things like TikTok and Twitter and stuff like that. Um, we rely a lot on the internet to get the word out about what we're doing. And of course we have the wonderful ElfQuest website where you can go and get all the information you want. ElfQuest.com is, is where you, anything you wanna know about ElfQuest you can find out, plus our appearances and current news and things like that. Yeah, and the first 40 years or so of the comic are, are online at ElfQuest.com. That was Richard's idea back in um, the mid 2000s. ElfQuest was optioned yet again for a movie, <laughs> this time by Warner Brothers. And Warner Brothers told us that they didn't want us publishing anything new for as long as the four year option was active uh, because they were going to be seeking publishing rights and so forth. Uh, if a movie should emerge from this. So during that four year period, uh, Richard was concerned because, you know, if you go away even for a few months, uh, the public's memory is very short and, uh, you know, you kind of disappear from the radar. So Richard had this amazing idea to put most of the comics online for free and he had help uh, from Rob and Heather Biskitza, David Misajewski, um, uh, some people who started out if, as fans, but have really entered our inner circle as, as helpers and staff. And um, working, working with them, uh, Richard managed to put all of this material up online for free and keep ElfQuest in the public eye for those four years. During those four years, that's when I did Mask. I did Mask of the Red Death as a webcomic and finished it during those four years. I, I didn't want to sit idle, so I wanted to pursue, now that I had time to do it, I pursued Mask. But Richard kept ElfQuest in the public eye online for free and again, gained us a whole new audience. People discovered it that way. So again, my hat is off to him. I don't wear hats very often because they're always off to Richard. <laughs> that um, reminds me of a question I sort of bypassed. Um, so Mask was um, digitally based and you were a bit of an early adopter for digital yes. tools and moving away from traditional, traditional yes. tools towards digital tools. Yeah, I've been, uh, I've been working digitally since the early 2000s. Um, did it change your process at all or the way you work? To a certain extent, um, because uh, it, it, changes, uh, it changes your inking line a little bit. Um, my inking line got cleaner, less feathery. Uh, some people liked that, some people didn't. I liked it. Um, I still to this day love the look of animation. And when you do artwork di digitally, you can really achieve uh, a very sleek animation quality to your work, which I, which I loved to apply to ElfQuest. I think the, 
my finest work digitally has been in um, the final quest, which was finished in 2018. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, my, my amazing assistant, but he's much more than that. He's, he's like my brother, Sonny Strait, uh, uh, did a great deal of the color on final quest, but, but I, he was also working digitally. And so I would, I would do the art and the inks and, and together we got the colors done. And, uh, I just think it's, uh, digitally speaking, it's Elf Quest's finest hour. Great. And I, I see, um, I don't know if we want to turn it over to questions. I see that Sign had a couple of questions that they posted in the chat. And I think one was about, um, where was it? Your art style, how you developed your art style. You mentioned your influences mm -hmm. on the one hand, um, Kirby and Tezuka on the mm -hmm. uh, sort of the other hand, um, because both were many more <laughs> both were cartoonists. Um, <laughs> prior to that, doing science fiction illustrations uh, and so forth, um, I had a kind of a typical fairy tale fantasy style. Uh, some of my even earlier influences were C. Aubrey Beardsley, Evan De Earl, um, uh, Arthur Rackham. You know the classic fairy tales. Um, illustrations like that, Maxfield Parrish. So my work was had a kind of a classical feeling to it. And um, I have always been drawn to what I call the line of beauty, which is a, a very sensuous S curve. I, I like to work that into my work. And, um, oh, you're gonna hold up the book. <laughs> there you are, line of beauty. Yes, this is Richard's amazing uh, biography of me, uh, uh, biography of my work, which he was nominated for an Eisner for, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, extremely proud of that. Uh, but uh, oh, I like I like that things have switched now. We I can I can see more of uh, the faces of folks participating. Hello, everybody. Um, so. Uh, Yes, but, but uh, Jack Kirby and Osamu Tezuka, my two main influences, were both cartoonists in their way. Uh, Jack's work was very exag exaggerated and uh, to the point of caricature. So he was quite the cartoonist and, and I gravitated to that. Uh, from Jack's work, I learned solidity, weight, mass, action, how to put mass into movement to show that a mass is moving through space. He taught me all of that just by observing his work. And with Tezuka, I learned um, grace, fluidity, the line of beauty, delicacy, uh, all of that that you can find in manga. Um, and uh, I combined the two. So the, So when I draw the elves, they have some of the classic manga features with the large slanted eyes and uh, childlike proportions to the faces and smaller bodies. Uh, the elves have that, but they also have mass and, and you know, cutters. You wouldn't want to meet him in a dark alley. alley. He's like 60 pounds of muscle and you just, you know, you wouldn't want to piss him off. So, <laughs> so um, yeah, that that's really the basics of my comic art drawing style is those two those two influences okay great um i think if folks want to ask uh, their questions you can probably unmute yourself um sign you have your hand up if you want to raise your hand i'll call on folks sure i'd love to talk to somebody yeah i just i just wanted to um redirect that question that i asked a little bit so as a new comics creator who's trying to develop her artistic skills, now it sounds yes. like looking at um, people to emulate is one thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I've gotten the advice, just draw a lot. Is there anything else that you would add to that? Well, the advice you got to draw a lot is the most important advice you can get because you're gonna find out where your passion is. 
you're going to find out what you love to draw most, and you should aim to promote that in your work. What, uh, believe it or not, I, I know it sounds a little bit woo woo, but what you love to do is where you should put all of your passion for your work. You know, don't try to do something just because you think it's commercial mm -hmm. or that, that it might get you a job. Develop your own personal style through what you love, which is exactly what I did. You know, it's, it's just what, if you feel that excitement while you're working, hang on to that and, and realize that you are telling yourself, this is what I want to be doing. And, and trust that, definitely trust that because it's the real deal. Thank you, that's, that's very inspiring. Oh, good, I'm glad. Valida, do you have a question? Hi, yeah, I was just uh, wondering if you could talk a little bit about maybe the time difference for uh, your digital pages versus your uh, traditional pages, like uh, what, what does a complete page take time-wise, you know? In the two well, different uh, one of the things that makes working digitally so valuable is the time that it saves you because you work in layers and, you know, the best example I can give you is you can be working on inking a comic book page, you know, a, an elaborate comic book page that you've penciled and you're busy inking it and you knock over your ink bottle and it spills all over that page. There is no rescuing it. You have to start all over again. And maybe you lose a day or a day and a half worth of work. If you make a mistake digitally, you go back through history to the point where the mistake happened and you can start from there and just go ahead. And you don't lose a full day of work. <laughs> so, um, also, for me personally, digital goes faster for some reason. Uh, maybe it's because you don't have the drag of the pencil on the texture of the paper. It's just, it's just a very slick, swift way of drawing. And it makes you draw more loosely. One of the most important things is to draw with your whole arm. I stand up when, my, when I work. I have my uh, Wacom tablet set up in a standing position and I stand to work at it because sitting is the new smoking. It's, it's terrible for you. <laughs> so the more you can stand up when you're working, the better. Um, and this, this enables you to work with your whole arm and make your, make your art more, more fluid, put more motion into it. Um, a lot of people draw like this. They draw really, really tight and they love to work with rapidographs, which makes them ink even tighter. And it's, I don't recommend that. I, I really recommend, um, especially if you're doing uh, characters who are not ordinary humans, who are superheroes or fantasy characters who fly and, and uh, can move in the world quite, quite more expansively than ordinary human can. You, you, you wanna give that feeling of, of broad motion and swiftness and, and just, kinetic energy. And, and all of that comes from drawing more loosely. Like an animator, animators draw very loosely. Thank you. You're very welcome. I hope some, that helped. Some good Hi. ergonomic room. Yeah, Lisa? Hi. Um, just wanted to say I wrote Richard a, an obnoxious letter back in 1984 insisting that you all keep your integrity with the uh, story and never sell it to any filmmaker that would alter it. Oh, did you? Yes, and he was very <laughs> he, polite. <laughs> he probably remembers that letter. <laughs> he might. <laughs> it was typed on a typewriter, but um, two-part question. First of all, do you ever see anyone directly imitating you in the media? Uh, you, the, the con more complex oh, there, characters. There are ElfQuest oh. influences everywhere. Wonderful. Uh, DuckTales, uh, uh, a young uh, man who uh, worked for us as an inker and colorist uh, uh, became uh, one of the, the storyboarders and directors on DuckTales and he designed 
a couple of characters that looked exactly like Cutter and Skywise. You, you knew they oh. couldn't be anybody else. And so they were animated. So, so in a sense, we've, we've seen what our characters would look like animated. Um, we were an influence on Gummy Bears. Uh, uh, Art Vitello, who was behind Gummy Bears, told us that he was aware of ElfQuest and that's, that's how they came up with the idea of the tribe. Uh, we were uh, influential on uh, Avatar: The Last Airbender. Ah, yeah. Some of the costumes. If you, if you look at some of the costumes, uh, especially the snow, uh, the, the snow character costumes, they're a lot like the Gobacks. Um, uh, I think they even used Cutter's wolf helmet for one character. Oh my god. Um, we, we have seen so many. E even the producer of Xena. Warrior Princess came up at, at uh, San Diego Con and told us that uh, ElfQuest really inspired him with oh, the wow. with Xena and and so when it comes down to it, the, the thing we get told the most often is it's just because we went out and did it our way uh -huh. that other creators took inspiration from that and and felt that. Well, if Wendy and Richard could do it, why can't I? And I think that's what we hear the most is just you inspired me because you just went out and did it your way. And so I felt that I could go ahead and maybe have a chance. Oh, wonderful. And that, yeah. that kind of ties into the second part of the question, which is, does it give you encouragement to see something like Avatar, The Last Airbender or Frozen, where they don't necessarily have good, bad uh, fight this guy, fight mm -hmm. that guy, more complicated, because at some point they're going to realize ElfQuest is, is every bit as cool as Last Airbender, if not more so. So, you know, I've still got hope. <laughs> you go ahead and hope. We, <laughs> we, are, we are happy with whatever happens. You know, okay. we've been at it for over 45 years and maybe come ElfQuest's 50th anniversary, we'll see, you know, something. Do, do we need a movie? Do we need a TV series? Absolutely not. Would we enjoy it? Yes, I think we would if they, if they don't mess it up too much. Um, a lot of times we've said we'd rather have no movie than a bad movie. And there's an awful lot of bad translations of literary properties into film and television these days. So, you know, stuff that makes us cringe and, and you know, we don't want to see that fate for ElfQuest. Well, I, I just want to conclude by saying I couldn't agree more with you. I'd rather just have the comic as it is than ever see a crappy version. So thank yeah. you. Yeah, I mean, whatever happens, ElfQuest is ElfQuest and we did it our way and we got the story told and we're very pleased about that. Right. <laughs> Sign. So um, I haven't read your webcomic yet, and I just learned about it. I'm going to go read it immediately. Oh, you I can't. Mean, oh, no. <laughs> okay. But have, have, no, have no worries. What has happened is that since the musical has been fully developed and recorded and everything, we are rebuilding the MASK website so that we can feature clips from the musical, the, from the songs, and we can... Uh, basically show the public, uh, you know, what this is. And also uh, the um, graphic novel that came out of the web comic uh, is also being uh, revised to more reflect the musical. Hmm. And so all of that is going to be available once we get the new website up. So just be patient. <laughs> because we'll be announcing it everywhere when it finally goes up. <laughs> I, I will look for that. But my question yeah. was about um, where you hosted it. Like there are places like Tapas and or Tapas and Webtoons. Um, I was wondering if you thought about any of those or if you hosted it on your web website and how oh, this you was long ago. This it, it started in 2007 when when web comics were kind of an early thing, you mm -hmm. know. And um, we, we created our own stage for it. It was, it was flash animated. So nothing that we did back then will run now. Uh, <laughs> you know, flash is just completely out, outmoded now. Um, but, but we created our own 
mask website and a stage. And uh, I would draw, I would draw and paint and write four pages a week. And then on Friday, I would break up the page into a three minute animated flash movie. And I would, the, I, I designed the characters so I could move body parts and things and get a little bit of animated motion into them. One of the things that's going to go up on the new mask website is a compilation, a movie that lasts about two hours of the whole animated webcomic. So you will be able to see what it looked like back in the mid 2000s. Um, it, it's a, you know, it's almost like a historical thing. We really felt people should see that. Cool. So, it, it reminds yeah. me a lot of that animatics work that I'm finding on YouTube now where Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Fla Flash was the way to do it back then. There are so many more computer programs now like Toon Boom and stuff where it can be done so much more easily <laughs> than it was done back then. But, uh, you know, little by little we learn. You're already over time. Um, Jennifer, do you want to go? Um, yeah, I just wanted to um, hi. ask. Hi. Um, I have been reading your work. I discovered it when I was uh, in, in graphic novel form. It was the first graphic novels I've ever read. Wonderful. Kind of, you. It's been influenced me to do my own comics. But <laughs> I was wondering. Are you, pub um, are you published or uh, web doing it on the web? web? I did web comic, um, mm -hmm. and then that finished. And I'm currently kind of still a little bit in hiatus, so I'm working on my ne next project. I totally get it. Congratulations! I, uh, thank you. I did want to ask what it was like transitioning from ElfQuest to uh, Mask of the Red Death, working on it. Because when I, I saw it the first time, Mask of the Red Death, um, I saw like how animatic it was. Yes. And that was definitely something that I could feel in ElfQuest, but um, mm -hmm. I wanted to know like how it felt to be able to do a lot more of those movie type things that you might've wanted to do in ElfQuest, but couldn't. Well, um, I, I have played around and done a little bit of ElfQuest animation, you know, just, just fooling around with it. Um, you see, I had had, Again, you know, I, I don't tend to think small. So I had had the idea for Mask for a long time too. And I was so grateful to have those four years, uh, you know, where I couldn't do ElfQuest uh, to, I had that window to do the Mask webcomic. Um, my influences for the look of the art, uh, as I'm sure you've seen, it's very different from ElfQuest, come from um, Evan de Earl. Uh, who, who was the designer of Disney's Sleeping Beauty. And you know, his work was very edgy and spooky. And um, there was also a, uh, an amazing cartoon that came out in the early 50s, I believe. It was put out by Paramount. And it was another Poe adaptation. It was uh, The Telltale Heart. You may have seen this. Uh, you can find it on, you can definitely find it on YouTube. Uh, go look up the Telltale Heart. Uh, UPI was the company, uh, and it is it is done the way Mask got done, which is uh, through dissolves and you know pans and and camera work. the The animation itself uh, doesn't move uh, like like traditional two D animation. It's it's more just camera camera work and that was a tremendous influence on me too so I this is what I wanted to do and I just happened to get the window to do it and I was ready with the style because I knew the style had to be totally different from ElfQuest this was going to be this is, was an adult x-rated erotic horror comic and so it was quite different from ElfQuest Thank you. And thank you for but working in di working in different styles really stretches you. Oh. Don't be afraid to. Okay. <laughs> Brian, uh, you're next. Uh, thanks. 
Hey, Wendy, it's an Hi. honor to see you. Honor to hear you. Um, I grew up with you guys as well. Um, you talked about Jack Kirby working. What did you call him? A, a unsolicited a tutor, or a tutor or something? Or he was. He, well, you see, he was. He was my sensei unaware because sensei. I met uh, Jack when I was nineteen years old. I visited wow. him at his home in Thousand Oaks. And I brought my portfolio with me, and my portfolio was full of everything I had done for Stormbringer. Uh, oh. So, so this elaborate artwork, you know, for, for this elaborate, impossible project. And Jack went through my portfolio, and he looked at me and he said, if I ever catch you working in comics, I'm going to spank you. <laughs> Jack, Why? Jack Jack did not feel that comics was a suitable profession for a young lady. Uh, oh, interesting. <laughs> interesting. He was very old school. He and he was exactly like Ben Grimm. Jack was oh. the thing. He was the thing. <laughs> and so every time Richard and I saw Jack at a convention after that, you know, when Elfquest had gotten launched and was going. Uh, I would say to Jack, I'm still waiting for my spanking. <laughs> he, would, he would blush. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's awesome. I was, I was curious to what, how much of an influence he had on your work and oh, what very was it like so. working with him. Very okay. much so. If you look at my trolls, my trolls yeah. are Jack Kirby trolls. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Well, I, I have to, oh, one other thing before. It, so in your large oversized volumes that you guys printed back in the day back in the 80s then the back of the books were usually a group shot of all the characters and for my mother's birthday i drew a poster of all your characters for her for her um just as a as a present so um that's how much you influenced someone adults who didn't even collect or you know they were aware of comics but never collected so they loved your guys well, work. remember it was your mom and and El the art in Elfquest has a special appeal to women. So yes. uh, you know a lot of women who don't even read comics or even like fantasy or sci-fi will enjoy Elfquest artwork. I think it, I think it reminds them of illustrations for children's books that they remember. See, here's here's one of the subversive things about Elfquest that we haven't talked about yet, and uh -huh. and this I learned from Tezuka. Tezuka's characters, whether they're Astro Boy or Kimba the White Lion or his characters in Metropolis or Toritum, they wow. are all drawn to look enormously childlike. Mm. You know, with these cute little faces, big limpid eyes, you know, and they just look cute as can be. And Tezuka yeah. puts them through the worst horrible <laughs> stuff bloody right. gory violence right. and and you know death and yeah. decapitations and all of this yeah. so you, you take these adorable cute characters that just you know we as human beings we're all hardwired to relate to children we get, we get this immediate protective streak towards children so yeah. tezuka you know he instinctively knew that and he he designed his characters in this way. And then he puts them through this torturous storyline. <laughs> right. And well, do, you suppose creates... some of that do you suppose some of that had to do with, you know, the horror of Hiroshima and oh, the of atrocity? Because you had these innocent yeah. people and then you had this extreme yeah. horror and they, they, they understood that. And they were telling these stories with, like you said, yeah. with that in mind. There's a manga called Barefoot Gin that, yes, okay, that, yeah. reflects, that reflects a lot of Tezuka influence in the drawing style. And yeah. Barefoot Gin is a telling of those horrific times. And it's almost yeah. unbearable to read. But yeah. again, you see, you have this tension between the drawing style, which draws yeah. you in and makes you comfortable because it's childlike. And then yeah. you put... The, these wonderful childlike characters through awful stuff and yeah. and, and it's it, it creates a tension that just makes you come back for more it's hard to explain but but we used or i used that formula in elfquest and boy did it work 
Right. Yeah. Oh, I did. Yeah. And we can, well, and also sexual situations. Tezuka never shied away from sexual situations either. And and so, huh. putting characters that look like that into sexual situations, there's just this, you know, this tension that just keeps you coming back for more. Yeah. Well, again, I wanted to thank you <laughs> and uh, your incredible work and what you guys have done and brought. Uh, you and Richard are an incredible team. And uh, I look forward to seeing some of the other stuff you guys come up with. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, Richard is working right now on rebuilding the ElfQuest website as well, because now that the audio movie oh, awesome. is out, we have so much more uh, that we need to put on the website, uh, so much more information to get to people. And uh, so he's working on that right now and, and the uh, mask website at the same time. And, and you're gonna be able to see a lot of the new stuff that's going on with us on these on these new websites when they go up. Awesome, thank you so much. You're very welcome, thank you. Other questions? I don't see any other hands up. All right. Last yeah, chance. I have a question. All right. Um, I love your drawing style. Thank you. And uh, thank you. And my my background is actually in fine art. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering um, if you use photo reference or is it in top from your head or? Um, I very I very seldom use photo reference unless I want to be anatomically correct uh, with an animal. Uh, mm -hmm. particularly wolves or, or uh, hooved animals. I want to be sure I'm, I'm getting those hind legs right, you know, so I'll, I'll look that up. Uh, but when it comes to the human body, the elves are, are really cartoons and caricature. And I had spent so much of my early life just drawing and drawing and drawing. Um, I think uh, there was somebody else here that, that I said, you know, just, just the best advice you can get is just draw and draw and draw. And so um, uh, the human anatomy was something that was kind of second nature to me. And, and I just kind of squashed it, stretched and squashed it to, to do the elves almost in animation style. Um, so I, I really needed to do very little photo reference for, for, their, for their look but animals sometimes. And also if, if I need to draw props, like um, in Final Quest, I had to draw a whole fleet of uh, very spooky looking uh, ships, you know, very haunting uh, big sailed sailing ships. And I had never drawn anything like that before. So um, I, I used reference for those, but I, tr I tried to, to sort of, twist it and make it look something different so it it didn't look like like it came from earth i'm always trying to do that I'll, i will look at photo reference for something and i'll think how can i twist this so it looks like a fantasy that's fun to do too <laughs> just fantastic Thank and you. and it, i have like a little asterisk question did, did hmm. tessa could do a, a cartoon called marine boy no marine boy again was one of the in uh, Tezuka influenced cartoons, okay. but he did not design those characters. Okay. This was a, this was a, uh, was this Toei? It might have been the Toei company. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was Speed Racer and, and you look at Speed Racer, you look at his face. Right. And you can see that same beautiful, cute, big doughy eyed. Look. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So Tezuka was considered the Walt Disney of Japan. He influenced everybody uh -huh. and he still does. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. You're bringing me back with those seventies cartoons. <laughs> Thank <laughs> well, you so was, much. <laughs> there were so few of them. I mean, you look far too young to have even been alive in the seventies. So, uh, you know, I can't believe that you were, but <laughs> But uh, these these cartoons were were very rare and uh, often came on stations that uh, my TV didn't get. So I would go over to friends' houses who could get the stations just so I could watch them. <laughs> K 
Kira, did you have a question? I see a drawing up there. Somebody has put a drawing up. Could I also ask a quick question? I know sure. it's, I'm sorry for, but thank you for your generosity. And I love all these things you've been saying about, especially the non-duality of your story, striking mm -hmm. away from Christian values that are harmful and everyone's a hero of their yeah. own story. Yeah, just... and may I, may, may I hurry to say that true Christian values are something that I respect and love very much. Yeah. But I don't see a lot of that on, <laughs> online these days, shall we say. So. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, I was wondering, and you also said something really great about every character, no matter how awful, being kind of like the hero of their own story. And you have such totally. a big story with so many facets. Mm -hmm. I wonder if it was ever challenging to balance all those characters and to give them their own story and how you, how you kind of kept the story going and how you balanced everything and made sure everyone was given their own spotlight, but it didn't devolve into a totally disorganized mess. Well, that, that's a wonderful question. And I will tell you, it helps 1000% to have a main character who can carry the story all the way through. We had Cutter and Cutter comes along once in a millennium. You know, he was our fair haired boy. And we knew we were going to take our readers through his entire hero's journey, including the end of that journey. And um, so you meet him as a very young, untried chief who gets thrust into leadership too soon. And the story is an exploration of how his, his knowledge of leadership grows. And through that, the other characters all supported Cutter's hero's journey. Skywise, of course, was, you know, like that. You know, he was, he was just part of it. But, but all of the other characters were like fragments and reflections of the hero. And, and of course they had, had to have their own stories, but all of it was driven by the backbone of the story, which was the quest, Cutter's quest. And, and, and the nature of his quest was really all about finding the origins of the elf race, finding out who they were and where they really belonged and sending them home. You know, he had to do everything along the journey and that journey had to be inevitable. That's another thing is inevitability. When you're crafting a story, make sure that everything you put in the story makes what happens at the end inevitable. So that's, that's how we built it over 45 years is, you know, we knew what the conclusion was going to be. And so everything supported that. And along the way, we created other characters that were fabulous, that we loved and could definitely support their own stories. And they did, but, but in the end, it all supported the main, the backbone of the story. How was that? It was wonderfully insightful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> I think we are out of time. I'd just like to say thank you so much, Wendy, for joining us. And I enjoyed this so much. I'd be happy to do it again sometime. Thank you. Can I just get a round of applause from folks? Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.